So welcome to the third episode of, uh, sorry, the third episode of the fifth series of Entangled Discussions, back with a big bang, quantum and space. For those of you who are new to the talks, we're a friendly, inclusive group and we encourage interaction. So please use the chat box for any questions or observations along the way. And for those comfortable taking the mic, there'll be an opportunity to join in the conversations um, and ask questions during the events. Um, these talks are recorded and they'll go on to our Entangled Discussions YouTube channel, as well as being shared on LinkedIn. So today uh, we welcome a real deep dive expert in both quantum and space technologies, um, who's working on some of the most exciting developments within the field. So this talk had already sparked my imagination and discussing preparation at the KTN's UK Quantum Showpiece event last week um, raised that excitement more than a few notches. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Daniel Oye, a senior lecturer at the University of Strathclyde to talk about the development, benefits and challenges of the space quantum internet. Welcome, Daniel. Oh, Daniel, your, mic, your mic's off. Keeps killing me. After, after so many months or a year and a half, I, I should get used to this. Um, uh, yeah, so um, let, let me just uh, share my screen. And um, so um, I, I, what I thought today is that I'll, um, I'll just give um, you know, some things to consider um, for today's discussions. Um, um, I, I'm a I'm a, a senior lecturer um, at the University of Strathclyde up in Glasgow. Um, because of uh, COP26 at the moment, I'm uh, <laughs> avoiding Glasgow as much as possible for the moment. But um, but it's uh, good to be uh, to be uh, invited here to to say something about uh, some of the work that that I've been doing with a whole bunch of other people, and um, and where we're going. So th this talk or this this discussion is really about. Um, where are we really aiming for in terms of the development of space quantum technologies and uh, space quantum networking? So, um, you know, in the end, we, we're trying to uh, develop, you know, the space quantum internet. Um, so I'll, I'll try to give a little bit of background to what do we really mean by the quantum internet? Um, why space uh, is Going to be potentially very important for implementing the space quantum uh, for the quantum internet, uh, and also um, give a bit of background to some of the work that um, is happening around the world in order to build the technologies required in order to implement it, and also the kind of roadmap or the evolution of how it could um, play out in the next um, you know five, ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty years. Um, it's not an easy thing to do, um, and I'll talk something about you know, the challenges involved and what we're trying to do to, to overcome them. And uh, in the end, I'll, I'll just maybe say something about um, you know, the, the large scale vision about um, you know, what kind of constellations that we're going to have in, in space and um, a, re a real key enabling technology, which is that of uh, quantum memories, which will allow us to really distribute entanglement uh, over long distances across the entire globe. Uh, um, so what do we really mean by the quantum internet? Um, now, uh, if you haven't already seen this um, YouTube um, uh, TEDx talk um, by Stephanie Werner, um, I, you know, I, I suggest you, know, tr you know, try to, try to um, catch up with this, uh, this uh, very good, uh, more introductory talk about, you know, one vision of what the quantum internet could be, right? And when we really say the quantum internet, it's really about um, networking computers and devices, uh, and sensors, clocks, um, timing, all that kind of stuff, using um, quantum resources, not just um, you know, what we do today in the classical internet with, um, with uh, bits, uh, zeros and ones, but with quantum bits. Uh, in particular, quantum entanglement. And so uh, the quantum internet really is what can we actually do if we can network the entire world using quantum entanglement? And obviously the first thing that we want to, that we, you know, we can think about is, you know, uh, in analogy to what we're doing today with um, networking computers, we can network quantum computers. 
And because the natural um, language of quantum computers are, are qubits and entanglement, we need to be able to transmit quantum uh, bits and quantum entanglement uh, in order to network quantum computers. Um, not just about networking quantum computers, but we can e even think about um, you know, cloud quantum computing. So even if, if you don't have a quantum computer yourself, if you want to access quantum computing resources, um, today you, know, you can interact with them um, by sending them you know, commands, right? Normal you know, classical information to them. But in the future, we may want to interact with them um, in a quantum way. We want to send them quantum commands. And um, there's a particular way of doing quantum computing called the blind quantum computing, by which you can run a quantum program in a cloud quantum computer, but the people running the, the cloud quantum computer has no idea about what you are actually running on their computer. So to, to them, it's blind. But a necessary um, ingredient for this kind of um, secure remote computation is that you'd be able to send quantum states reliably over long distances. Oh, yeah, one of them is brilliant. And the quantum internet can also not only uh, network quantum computers, but they can also allow um, people who don't necessarily have their own quantum computer to run intrinsically quantum programs and control at a quantum level other quantum computers. Now, beyond actual computing, we can actually think of other tasks that can be enabled by this um, ability to, to communicate uh, at a quantum level. Um, for instance, if we are talking about um, things like uh, distributed timing and clocks and synchronization of, of time, then uh, there are ways by which you could um, say deploy um, in orbit um, networks of satellites, each with very high accuracy clocks, quantum clocks, and they communicate using quantum entanglement. And the quantum entanglement allows all these clocks to be highly synchronized, synchronized to a much higher level than uh, what we can do today. Um, now we can think about, well, what, you know, clocks in space. And we already know that clocks in space are the basis of, of GPS, of, of um, global navigation uh, position and timing. And if we are able to increase the accuracy by orders of magnitude by using quantum entanglement, then who knows what kind of applications we could, we could um, have if we were able to reduce the uh, inaccuracy of GPS by orders of magnitude. Also important for things like, um, say, high-speed trading. Um, you know, the, the, the more uh, synchronous you can make our time across the world, then we allow ourselves um, to be able to run our, um, our communication networks more um, accurately, quicker. Um, so there are a lot of actual applications when we have much better clocks, and those clocks are actually well-coordinated and synchronized. Um, obviously, one thing that's very um, relevant, you know, it's, um, it's about sensing, it's about Earth observation, it's about not only just taking photos of the Earth, but also things like uh, monitoring climate, monitoring the, uh, the flow of, of, of um, ocean circulation, of air masses, of, of um, you know, chemicals and substances in the atmosphere. So if you're able to um, network um, sensors in space using quantum entanglement, you can actually uh, increase their sensitivity and their accuracy. So again, the ability to distribute quantum um, resources, quantum entanglement over long distances throughout the world can uh, lead to um, new benefits beyond just simply, say, um, you know, quantum computing. Um, obviously, uh, the thing that is driving um, the, the you know, space quantum communications at the moment is secure communications. Uh, the ability to generate secure quantum keys that can be then used for encryption is going to be, I mean, it's the, it's, the, um, it's the obvious thing to start off with, but we see that that is actually just an initial stepping stone to all these other uh, tasks. And in general, there's also other types of quantum communication tasks that uh, go beyond simply just uh, encryption. Uh, things like, uh, qu um, like quantum digital signatures, uh, authentication, 
um, if you want to synchronize or you want to um, uh, manage large databases distributed, then there are a lot of uh, tasks which involve many people trying to make uh, coordinated decisions. And conventional techniques require a lot of communication or maybe they're error prone. Uh, and, you know, so I'd say, I mean, there, there's a famous problem called the Byzantine agreement problem. Uh, but if you use quantum mechanics, you can actually resolve that and actually um, solve that problem without. Um, and, and so the operation of networks themselves can be a lot more efficient if you can use entanglement in order to do these more general quantum communication tasks. Um, so, you know, there's a good article in Science magazine um, on um, here's the, 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 the DOI for, um, you know, about in general what, what the quantum internet could look like. And one of the key things is how do you distribute entanglement? Um, I won't go into the actual technicalities, but basically we can distribute entanglement um, and we can swap entanglement between two people uh, who have never met via intermediaries. And these intermediaries are able to basically swap entanglement. So if we're able to generate entanglement over short distances, and then um, where the, the, the entanglement in the middle meets, if we can measure that, then the two ends can then be entangled. Um, so it's, uh, so I won't go into the math, but it's, it's a very um, interesting uh, protocol by which you can actually generate entanglement between two people, um, but the entanglement itself never actually goes directly between those two people. It's via uh, swapping of uh, the quantum um, correlations that are, uh, that are in separate quantum states. So in the end, we're, we're trying to, what we're thinking of is, well, how do we distribute this in quantum entanglement around the world? So we have, um, so I'm obviously interested in, in how do we use satellites to do that? Uh, but we can do that, um, you know, um, say in free space, you know, so uh, for instance, between two, um, two places we can see each other, but also uh, what most people are interested in is obviously through uh, optical fiber. Right, send quantum states through optical fiber and distribute entanglement that way. Right. Um, so why do we necessarily need to go into space in order to build the quantum internet? Well, um, we're really talking about, you know, how do we use satellites um, in, um, you know, low, medium and, and geostationary orbit to distribute these, these uh, fragile quantum states? Usually we, we send these fragile quantum states uh, in, as part of photons. Uh, photons are um, fundamental particles of light. And each photon can carry quantum information. Uh, for instance, we can encode um, a qubit, quantum bit, in the polarization of a single photon. But if you try to send a single photon down an optical fiber, um, the optical fiber is made of outer glass. It's very, very pure and very clear glass. But if you try to send um, light down an optical fiber greater than about um, 500 kilometers long, um, basically hardly any light comes out the end, right? The probability of a single photon going through 500 kilometers of optical fiber is, is very, very small. Going beyond that, you know, up to a thousand kilometers, basically you could be waiting the age of the universe for a single photon to the end, right? So when we're talking about distributing the single photons across the globe, so, you know, we have to do it, you know, the, the diameter of the earth is, is um, 12,000 um, or 13,000 kilometers. Um, and if you go, you know, optical fiber one way, uh, you know, halfway around the world, that's 20,000 kilometers. So you're not going to be able to send single photons through an optical fiber um, to distribute entanglement throughout the world um, you know, uh, directly. Um, and, and this is because the losses in an optical fiber is exponential, right? We all know about exponential growth, but we also know, but we can also think about exponential decay, right? Um, exponentials, they, they grow very rapidly, but they also get very small very quickly as well. So we have to find a way of sending our single photons over long distances with some high, uh, with some um, reasonable amount of probability, right? 
And that's why we need to go to space. Because if you send photons through the vacuum of space, they don't get absorbed, right? We can see light from stars, which are millions, if not billions of light years away, all right? And the photons from those stars have traveled that large distance without being absorbed. Right. So if you're sending quantum signals from a satellite, most of the time it's just traveling through vacuum and it has to go through a limited amount of atmosphere, but the atmosphere, you know, it's fairly clear, right? You go on a clear night and you can see the stars, you can see the moon. So light doesn't have much of a problem actually going through the atmosphere. So instead of this exponential decay of light as it travels through an optical fiber, if we send light through space and through a small amount of atmosphere, then we can actually distribute quantum states um, with um, a reasonable amount of probability. Right. Um, the second reason why uh, we want to be in space is because a, a satellite can see a lot of the Earth. A single satellite can see you know, large bits of the Earth. And, and bits of the Earth, which are not uh, connected by an optical fiber, can see the sky. So for instance, um, if you wanted to talk to a, uh, an aircraft, or you wanted to talk to a mobile um, ground station, then an optical fiber will not work, right? You can't have a very long optical fiber trailing up to your, to your aircraft. But um, you can um, talk to a, a satellite using um, laser communications and to ground stations as well. So satellites, they, they give you the ability to send quantum states over long distances, but also to communicate with mobile and, um, and, and locations which are not well serviced by optical fiber. Right. Um, so I've talked about you know, some of the applications, what you can do, you know, quantum key distribution, distribute entanglement. Um, there's some techniques you can use in order to use quantum methods of communicating uh, classical information, but I won't talk about those. Uh, and I've talked about um, these things about, you know, time frequency distribution, GPS sensing, quantum internet, but also something which, um, you know, is one of my motivations is how do we then test physics? Uh, how do we test fundamental physics? Um, the relationship between gravity and general, general relativity and quantum mechanics, that is still a very open question. Uh, and we need scientific, we need experimental evidence as to how those two things um, uh, interact. Hence, we need to go to space in order to test over long distances, uh, over you know, large differences in gravitational field in order to really probe how does quantum mechanics actually interact with gravity. Right. Um, so, you know, this is sort of roughly, you know, what a, a space or satellite quantum network would look like and how it would interact with the ground segment. So uh, we've got um, terrestrial short range networks. We have optical ground stations which can talk to um, satellites. So here we've got a satellite and it's got a double downlink. So this could be distributing um, entangled photon pairs to these ground stations. Hence this ground station and this ground station could then be uh, entangled. And um, you know, they could use it for, say, for generating a secure uh, cryptographic key. Um, or you know, if this was able to transfer that entanglement to here, and this was able to transfer over here, then these two places, for instance, you could network two quantum computers located at different points. Um, we can send signals down. We can also send signals up. And we can also talk uh, or think about satellites talking to each other. So inter-satellite links are actually very important. Um, in, a, in a space quantum network, most of the links are actually between the satellites because you need to shuttle the quantum uh, information or the, or, the, or the cryptographic key around the world and you're doing it through the space layer. So if you go through the space layer, that represents a much lower loss channel than trying to do it directly using optical fiber on the ground. So there'll be a lot of inter-satellite links. Um, so 
how we're going to build this, right? And how how we're going to build up? We're not. I mean, a a full satellite space quantum network isn't just going to, you know, just pop out ab, ab initio, right? It's going to. There's an evolution in how it's going to develop, right? Um. So you know, at the very beginning, and this is what's being done at the moment, is that you have either a single satellite or maybe just a few satellites, and they're going to be implementing satellite quantum key distribution. So they'll be generating quantum keys uh, using things like uh, BB84, um, and uh, they'll be acting as a trusted node. So effectively, a trusted node is where, say, the satellite, uh, you know, creates a quantum uh, key with a, with a receiver. So let's say receiver B. And so now they share a, a key pair, a secure uh, uh, set of, of um, quantum keys that they can then use to encrypt information. Now the satellite, because it's in orbit, it uh, can go around the world and then uh, at a later time, it can then uh, do the same thing re with receiver A. So receiver A and the satellite can generate a second separate independent cryptographic key. So receiver B and receiver A, they both share a cryptographic key. Uh, they're separate, but they're, they share a, a cryptographic key with a satellite. So the satellite now has two keys. It's got one key for uh, receiver A and one key for receiver B. Uh, receiver A and receiver B at this point, they do not have a shared um, key, so they can't communicate yet. But if the satellite takes the two keys that uh, it holds and it does a mathematical operation to it and then broadcasts the result, so everyone in the world knows, this, um, this result is it's the uh, exclusive all operation of these two random keys for those who, who are familiar with it. Um, the XOR of these two keys allow receiver A and receiver B to find out what the other person's key is. But Anyone else, even if they know the this this um, this broadcast message, they can't tell the individual keys. They can't tell what the individual keys are. So this this is a kind of key swapping um, thing. It's a classical process, and it's nothing quantum. But it's just the fact that if you've got two separate random strings, you take the XOR of those two random strings and you broadcast the result. If you know one of the random strings, you can find the value of the other random string. Right. Mm -hmm. This is used in, uh, if anyone is familiar with um, error correction or um, distributed, um, you know, like RAID, like RAID 5 or something like that, some redundant storage, it's the same kind of thing. It's like a parity bit. Yeah. So a trusted node can distribute entanglement throughout the entire globe using a single satellite, but you need to trust the satellite. Now, for some circumstances, that's perfectly reasonable. So let's say that you're a government, you've built the satellite, you operate the satellite, you, you operate the ground station, um, you know, you trust everything in that system, therefore this thing works for you, right? In the future, we want to get to the point where, for instance, um, Alice and Bob, receiver A and B, they don't need to trust the satellite in order to guarantee that they share a secure cryptographic key that they can then use, all right? And we use entanglement for this, right? So for instance, if the satellite, we, we, this is called untrusted node. So the satellite distributes entanglement to receiver A and B. The correlations, the quantum correlations in that entangled pair, when receiver A and receiver B measure those entangled photons, they generate, um, uh, a random bit each, and those random bits are correlated to, to each other. Now, the thing about quantum entanglement is that it is called monogamous. Uh, it means that entanglement can only be uh, perfectly shared with one other person, right? So if those correlations between receiver A and receiver B are perfect, that means no other person in the world, no other thing in the universe can have any information about what those two random results were. All right? And they can test this. So they can test whether their results are perfectly or, or highly correlated. Even if they're not highly, highly correlated, they can do things in order to make them perfect or basically perfectly correlated. So 
in this way, you don't need to trust that the satellite actually was distributing entanglement, whether it was doing what it was supposed to do. You can test it. So this verifiable security is really what we want to get to in terms of satellite key distribution. And we, we can do it. One method is to use entanglement. So if we can distribute entanglement from a satellite to any two places in the Earth, then those two places can communicate absolutely securely. And so this is called untrusted node satellite QKD. And that's really the holy grail in terms of, of, of quantum key distribution is that allow that, um, that service, that ability um, between any two people on the globe. Um, and basically we need to build up new technology for that. Um, over relatively short distances, say a thousand kilometers, you know, 2000 kilometers, we can do that by directly transmitting the entanglement, right, from a satellite to two ground receivers. But as soon as the two receivers are farther apart, um, you know, the range gets a bit too big. And also, um, we stop being able to see two things simultaneously, right? If they're over the horizon, even from the satellite, then um, you, you, know, you can't directly send the, the entanglement to those two places at once. So what we need is what's called uh, quantum memories or quantum repeaters. So these are ways of uh, effectively uh, bending the entanglement around the globe and making this process of sending this entanglement much more efficient. Um, so there's, there's lots, of, lots of different ways of doing that, but um, I won't go into that. Um, any questions at this point? Uh, no? So I noticed um, that Daniel had um, has raised a couple of questions. So um, Daniel, did you want to did you want to come in? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, John. Uh, so I'm just curious, and I, I've read some papers uh, concerning um, photon photon entanglement uh, from uh, ground to satellite communications. Mm -hmm. That this was sort of a proved out concept. I read this as a few years back. Uh, what I'm curious about is. <clears throat> situations where it might become more problematic for those ground to satellite communications versus satellite to satellite. So sending, you know, these photons uh, across the vacuum seems like you have less of a potential risk of, of issues with decoherence, but any kind of signal you send through the atmosphere, it has a lot more risk for absorption or other interactions with the photons as they traverse through the atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And it's something that I'll get to. So, so I think <laughs> yeah, if you wait a few slides, I'll, I'll discuss this exact point. Um, oh, fantastic. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. All right. Well, I'll just go and, and maybe maybe some of these questions will be answered as I go along, right? Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit because um, I've, but I just wanted to set the stage, right? Exactly what we're, what we're aiming for. What's the vision? Right. Um, so the big, um, seismic shift in the whole area uh, of space quantum communications really happened in um, 2016, 2017, when China launched um, the Quest experiment. So this is quantum entanglement and space scale with a Macias um, um, satellite. And they were able to demonstrate basically everything that everyone had proposed, um, at least for in the short term, in terms of what you could do with a satellite and quantum um, and, and quantum experiments. So the main thing is they, they were able to distribute entanglement over 1,200 kilometers and actually perform um, one of the classic uh, entangled QKD protocols called ECHAT-91, E91. Um, and um, this would have been impossible to do using optical fiber. Um, they were able to actually teleport quantum states from the ground to the satellite. And they're able to do this trusted node QKD between uh, Austria and, and China. Um, and um, you know, this is a relatively large satellite. So this is uh, 635 kilograms. Um, cost a lot to launch and to operate. And they spent a lot of money developing this over probably a decade um, or more than a decade to develop this kind of technology. Um, the rest of the world, they set up. Um, they really, uh, there's been a rush really to try to catch up. So, you know, some people like to say there's a quantum space race 
which has been sparked by, by um, the, the Quest experiment. This is a 2018 um, uh, picture of, of you know, what was happening, you know, what had been sparked in that short period of time, what other people were, were planning to do. Uh, I like to say that other people were working on this. Um, so I like to say, you know, that I was working with Singapore since 20, 2009 on this. Other people had proposed satellite QKD in the late 90s. And, um, you know, there were some, in, some pioneering um, proposals from, uh, from Europe in the early 2000s about how you could really do large scale or long distance entanglement distribution from space. But there's been a lot of activity around the world, and I'm associated with a couple of these, um, a couple of these uh, uh, missions that are going up in the next couple of, of years. Um, so here, it, this is some of the work that I've been doing: is that I've been trying to miniaturize these entanglement sources to be put into space. So um, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, a, um, an, a, a quantum entanglement experiment would have taken a whole optical table. But we've been able to miniaturize it to something the size of, of yeah, that it could hold in, a, in, a, in, your, in the palm of your hand um, and make it rugged so that even if your rocket blows up, which our first mission did, a <laughs> mission blew up um, when, when the rocket it was on, um, yeah, blew up in, within a minute of launch or a couple of seconds of launch. We recovered that experiment. We recovered the actual entanglement source and it worked perfectly. So you have to really build these, um, these components, these subsystems to be very rugged, to be able to survive launch. Uh, obviously we don't want our, our experiments to blow up uh, on launch, but um, you know, these are the kind of things that we have to design them in order to be able to get them to space. Uh, on a second try, we, we, we managed to get our experiment working and then uh, on the third um, uh, mission, we're able to demonstrate that we're able to generate this quantum entanglement in a very small package. So instead of the 635 kilogram uh, Missius satellite that China launched, um, this satellite that we launched was actually 2.6 kilograms. So we're able to miniaturize the technology. Um, obviously, we, did, we didn't do as much as what they did, right? But the entanglement source that we were able to produce could fit on a much much smaller satellite than than what they were using, um, and you know we would then we proposed could we take this entanglement and, and send it uh, using these small satellites these cubesats, um, and so this is what people now are trying to do. Um, I lead a um, uh, sort of an activity within the UK called Quark Quantum Research CubeSat. Um, you know we've done a lot of design work, uh, system design, some experimental um, prototyping. Um, you know, this is a 3D uh, printed model of, of an of a, uh, acquisition pointing and tracking system. Um, and we want to miniaturize everything that would go on, a, on the 635 kilogram satellite and make something that's <coughs> about, say, 10 kilograms in total. Uh, and there's a company um, that uh, we're working with called Craft Prospect in Glasgow, which is really working to make this uh, a reality, right? How to take this um, uh, quantum satellite quantum key distribution and miniaturize it so it's the size of basically a large shoebox. And the satellite would be able to transmit single photons from orbit to the ground in order to securely um, um, you know, generate these cryptographic keys around the world. And this, is, this is not an entangled source. This is a sort of a weak coherent pulse source, but still you can see the kind of miniaturization that we've that we that we've been able to achieve, and we're sending up another source also on a Canadian satellite which should, which should go up um, in the next couple of years. Um, we're also developing the ground stations. It's no use having satellites without having ground stations on, that you can talk to. Uh, so this is a, a, a commercial um, uh, sat, um, sorry telescope called a, a plane wave um, CDK four hundred that we're mounting. Um, our equipment on the back of it in order to analyze the quantum signals that are being sent from a satellite. So we can track satellites. Uh, this is just a, um, a test um, tracking the International Space Station as it goes across the sky. Uh, this is a 360 degree uh, panorama that I took. Um, and so, you know, this we can track low Earth orbit satellites, which you know, isn't actually that easy. Um, so what's, while we're developing that, you know, there are much bigger efforts. Uh, for instance, Europe 
um, the European Union and the European Space Agency are collaborating to develop what's called the quantum communication infrastructure. And basically they're trying to build the quantum internet, right? Build the quantum internet within, the, um, within, within Europe. Even within Europe, a lot of the places can be done via fiber. A lot of the connections can be done by fiber. But if you want to get to the edges, right? If you want one part of, of say Ireland to talk to Greece, you need satellites in order to, to get those to talk and to distribute entanglement between them. So, um, you know, uh, ESA is working on, on a series of, of, of missions in order to develop that. So they want to do QKD, they want to do digital signatures, authentication and clock synchronization. And then eventually, you know, if, if they are successful, they should be able to distribute entanglement and use that for things like um, um, computer, quantum computer networking. Um, I'll, I'll just speed up here. Um, so we've done bits like uh, uh, try how to design the constellations. Um, I work with Airbus in a, in a consortium in order how to see what, what, what's going to happen in the future. In 10 years down the track, what are the satellite systems going to look like? Um, we're going to have multi-tier systems, multi-layer systems, different kinds of satellites doing different things. Uh, we should be able to also, also service other satellites. So if you want to securely uh, command the control and download data from, from other satellites, then they need to be able to get secure um, uh, key from those. Um, talking to talking to aircraft, talking to ground stations. So we've done things like, um, you know, how would you build a network to securely connect aircraft? So what's the kind of constellation that you need to build in order to do that? So um, you know, each each satellite in this um, in this cyan layer, this this sort of uh, greeny blue layer, underneath it is the area in which it can actually talk to a, to an aircraft. And then, um, you know, as each um, satellite goes over an aircraft, it can generate a secure key via QKD. And then these uh, low altitude, um, lower altitude uh, satellites can then talk to the higher altitude satellites, the ones in yellow. And then we can relay the cryptographic key to this relay layer. And this relay layer, this, this very large ring, can then downlink to a ground station. So this is how we can get a, an aircraft to be securely connected to the rest of the world via these, um, these constellations. And we've done work on you know, how do we optimize the, the altitude of these satellites to, to maximize the, the, the amount of Earth that can generate these keys. Um, so go, going on to the question that was raised earlier, you know, what, um, what is the, the, the challenges, right? As I say, launch in the space environment. Absolutely, it's, 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 it's critical to, 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 to be able to build things that can survive launch and operate in the extremes of space. Um, the, the, the losses you get when you try to send um, uh, quantum states over long distances, the optics required to do that. Um, atmospheric absorption turbulence and weather. So this is this is the next slide. I'll go into a bit more detail. Um, how to operate in daylight because you know background light is a big problem. Talking to fast moving satellites. There are a few other technical things, but you know how do you operate the the constellation? Um, and also we want new protocols. We need new new ways of using these networks. So even if you're not you know into you know, space hardware or, or, hard, or experimental quantum optics, developing the applications and developing the protocols and algorithm that can run on such a network is actually, I think, the priority, right? We need things to run on the hardware, right? We do have a set of, of, of applications already, but more applications and more ways that we can use this and exploit this kind of network is, is really um, important. Um, so atmosphere, right? Um, now there's two ways of, of, of trying to operate your, 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 sat your space to ground link, right? You can either send photons from space to ground or you can send photons from ground to space. Now there's a thing called the shower curtain effect. It means that if you try to send uh, photons from the ground up. As the photons go through the atmosphere and experience things like turbulence, it will get deflected. 
And since that deflection is far away from your satellite, when by the time it gets to your satellite, it misses the satellite by a long way, right? If you go the other way, if the satellite sends a photon down to your ground station, to your, to your telescope on the ground, it only experiences any perturbation, any, any changes in its direction when it gets close to the ground. So by the time it gets to the ground, it hasn't actually gone very far. So it means that actually downlink is actually preferable to uplink. Um, and this has some consequences for the way that we operate our networks. And also it has quite um, significant consequences on the complexity on the satellite. So for a satellite, you wanna put the source, the quantum source on the satellite, rather than put the detectors on the satellite and send quantum states to it. But turbulence, um, you know, that distorts the, the, the beam that trying to send. We get absorption um, through, you know, through the atmosphere. We get a little bit of extra uh, scattering and, and absorption. Um, and we get sunlight we can, which can basically um, um, uh, disturb, create noise. So reduce the signal to noise ratio. And obviously the big elephant in the corner is cloud, uh, fog, rain. Uh, this is a big problem, and everyone is really working hard to try to solve this. It's not just a problem for quantum optical communication. Uh, people, uh, the industry, the satellite industry is going towards laser communications to satellites and between satellites. Uh, already there is the European Data Relay Service, which is an, uh, an optical laser communication system between satellites. Uh, but people want to be able to transmit large amounts of data from space to ground using lasers. So there's a lot of people trying to work very hard on this problem. Um, I won't go into the, into the kind of solutions that people have come up with, but you know there are perhaps ways that we can get around the problem that the sky is not always perfectly clear. Um, so th this goes, you know, even without any clouds or anything, the fact that we're, we're sending these over long distances and we do have diffraction, um, beams do spread out and, and so that your, your telescope receiver can't capture all of the signal. When you're sending entanglement from a single satellite down to two ground stations, um, basically the probability that both photons reach the ground and are and detected Basically, you're squaring the probability that one photon does, right? So just to give an example, if there's a 1% chance for one photon to reach the ground and 1% for the other photon to reach the ground, the probability that both photons reach the ground simultaneously is 1 in 10,000, right? If it was one, if it's one in one thousand for one link and one in one thousand in the other link, then it's one in a million for both photons to reach the ground simultaneously. So basically, we're squaring the losses or doubling the decibel loss of each channel. So for trying to distribute entanglement where you need both photons to reach the ground simultaneously so that entanglement can be distributed, this is a big drawback, right? So we need a way of being able to um, distribute entanglement more efficiently without this doubling of the losses. And this is where we have to use um, things like quantum memory, the quantum repeaters, which effectively allows you to uh, create entanglement between the satellite and ground on one channel, create a separate entangled channel on the other side, and then you do what's called entanglement swapping in the middle so that the two bottom uh, the two ground stations are entangled without this huge uh, loss, with this, this, this low probability of getting the entanglement generated in the first place. Um, I won't go into details. I don't have much time. and just want to leave at least some discussion time uh, later on. But basically, you know, this is 10 years, 20 years down the track, really. But at the moment, this is what we're trying to do at the moment is actually work out how do we build these quantum memories to be put into space and how do we operate them and how well will it work? How does, what does it mean in terms of building the constellations and the network of, of satellites in space in order to enable this large scale quantum entanglement distribution? So I'll just end with this conclusion slide, but um, yeah, open discussions now.
Yes, we've had. Uh, first of all, fantastic, Daniel. I think um, really informative, some very complex topics um, answered in, a, in an accessible way. So fantastic talk. And no, normally I'd have lots of questions lined up, but I'm, I'm cognizant of the time here and I was always taught to sort of share. So um, Achari, um, you, you had some questions. So if you'd like to, to join. Yes. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? We yes. can, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. So uh, my question is, um, uh, once uh, we have um, uh, this uh, uh, satellite and the ground, it, uh, my question is also between two devices that are separated, like, for like example, two different satellites or a satellite and its ground station. Uh, how can we uh, uh, have an entanglement between um, uh, pairs of qubits in these two uh, separated uh, devices? And is it possible? Uh, in theory, it is possible, but uh, in practice, uh, uh, is it? Uh, how can we do that? Thank you. Yeah. So uh, it depends on what you want to do with the entanglement. So at this, at the, um, in the near term, we want to use the entanglement to do um, uh, uh, quantum key distribution. We want to generate secure keys. So in that way, all we need to do is measure the entanglement. So for instance, um, what we're trying to do in a particular mission. Um, here, I've, I've got a picture here with the um, uh, Center of Conflict Technologies here, right? Um, we're generating entanglement on board. We're measuring one photon, and then we send the other photon to the ground. And then that photon on the ground is measured. And the correlations between the measurement results on board and on the ground, that gives you your, your, your secret key, right? So in that, yes. in that particular scenario, you don't actually store the entanglement. You just you generate the entanglement, you distribute it, and you measure it immediately. Right? In the future, what we want to do is that we want to use that entanglement for something else. Right? So for instance, if um, you want to use it for, um, um, for instance, uh, um, say, quantum networking of, of quantum computers, right? you need a way of taking that entanglement, that entangled photon, um, transferring it from you know, the, 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 the freely propagating um, photon, you collect it in the telescope, and then you take that photon and you, you focus it down into a, a, a fiber, optical fiber. So once in the optical fiber, you can take that, that, that photon over a short distance into your quantum computer, and then in your, once it's in your quantum computer, you can either store it, put it into a storage qubit, um, generate a bank of, of entangled qubits, right? So what you do is you distribute lots of entangled photon pairs and you, you basically collect entanglement. And then once you have a lot of entanglement between say one quantum computer and another quantum computer, then you could use that entanglement in order to do things like um, perform um, quantum operations. So like a two qubit gate can be performed between these two quantum computers using that entanglement. So, so this is why we need things like quantum memories in order to store the entanglement so that we can use it later. Uh, thank you very much. A very nice talk, thank you. And Gauri, I think um, if, if you'd like to, to come and join us as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Okay. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, <clears throat> Daniel for a fantastic talk. It was uh, very attractive and uh, very clear. Uh, and different, uh, I, I loved every aspect of it. Uh, one question. So regarding the <clears throat> entanglement, when we are talking about entanglement between different locations or sending photons, uh, they will be heavily affected by uh, decoherence. And uh, if I understand correctly, several measures need to be taken to, to, to preserve the coherence. So could you please outline some of these measures and and their technical feasibility. Yeah. So the thing about sending photons through vacuum and through the atmosphere uh, is that it, um, photons are very resistant to decoherence. So for instance, if you talk about the polarization degree of freedom of a single photon, uh, when it goes through vacuum, no decoherence at all. Right? They've measured the amount of decoherence um, of photons going through the atmosphere. And even at the very worst, it's, it's quite small, 
right? It's it's fractions of a percent. Mm -hmm. um, so so that's one thing. Um, if you get the photon, if it actually makes it through, then the actual quantum information in that photon is actually quite well preserved. Right? So really, the main consideration is that you know we we um, is, is basically the loss in the channel. Right. However, um, if we want to go think to, to, for instance, networking quantum computers, in that scenario, uh, maybe the entanglement that, that is uh, distributed or initially collected may not be at a sufficiently high fidelity, right? Instead mm -hmm. of 99.9% .9 that, you, that you have, you may need 99.999% um, fidelity. So what you can do then is that if you've got quantum memory and a quantum computer, once you collect um, uh, many different pairs of entangled photons, you do what's called quantum entanglement purification or, or entanglement distillation. Effectively, you're taking the entanglement in, in a few pairs, uh, several pairs, and then you distill it into a smaller number of, of, of entangled pairs but the entanglement in those smaller number of pairs is much better, or there's much less uh, reduction in, in the fidelity. So um, there are different ways of doing it, the different protocols, um, there are different uh, methods depending on your architecture. Um, there are methods which are optimized for, you know, if you don't have much, much memory. So, so there are different ways of doing it that doesn't require you to store, you know, millions of, of, of entangled pairs before you can do the, the, the distillation. Um, so you know, these are the kind of things that, that we would be um, trying to use if we wanted to scale this up and actually, for instance, uh, network quantum computers with this. Okay, thank you very much. I'm con cognizant of time here, but um, we did have, so Daniel did ask um, whether near-term quantum devices um, will be um, in, um, uh, taken on the satellites. Yeah. Um, so, so what what we've done so far is that we've um, created correlated photon sources. We've created entangled photon sources. Um, we are working on putting up the first stages of quantum memories in space. So, I'm working with people in um, in um, in Germany, in Berlin. Um, uh, we, we are proposing to work with people in, in Canada uh, and, 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 and also around Europe to try to build small quantum memories that we can actually put onto small satellites. Um, they're based on, on um, the first ones will be based on warm vapors. Uh, later on, we will then do cold vapors or cold gases. And eventually we are working towards things like um, rare earth doped uh, rare, rare, iron, um, rare earth iron doped crystals, but they require things like cryostats. Um, so whenever you need cryogenic um, temperatures in space, then the equipment is very expensive and very bulky. It's been done, right? They've, been, they've put um, cryostats into some major missions, but obviously we want to reduce the size of the of these um, of the cooling, we want to reduce the need for it. So there are different ways that we could put these kind of um, quantum memories into space, and we're actively working on on working out you know what's the best way of doing that. So could I tack on to that really quickly? Our team um, is actually working on trying to develop an integrated photonic circuit that mm -hmm. would make use of like a Bell state oscillator. So we we proved out like the tabletop design and we're trying to do a conversion over to like what would be like a small integrated circuit. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, picks are, are definitely one way forward. Um, so, so we're working with some, um, some companies which are, uh, yeah, they've developed picks of photonic integrated circuits for 1550. But, you know, obviously we would like to operate at the shorter wavelengths which are compatible with say uh, rubidium uh, memories or cesium memories. Um, so I think there's a lot of a lot of uh, potential there in these photonic um, integrated circuits. Um, yeah, definitely would be interested in, in hearing about you know whether it could be made space compatible or not. And um, I'm I'm conscious today that we've got a, a fairly hard de hard deadline today. Yeah. So 
Um, five, I probably could wait. I could probably do five more minutes. Yeah, perfect. Um, so, um, Bill Gonzalez, um, again, as, as always, very active in the chat. Would you, would you like to come and join us? Sure. Uh, how you doing, John? Thank you. This is an excellent presentation. Really appreciate uh, uh, being at the subject and uh, the topics that are being discussed. Uh, you know, I was I was interested also in just uh, some of the concepts uh, regarding uh, the uh, the length of, of uh, the communication signal. In other words, uh, what's being done in regards to repeaters um, in, in that regard. In other words, as as the uh, the signal may be fading or dissipate. Um, is there is there any study being done on how to uh, replicate or boost that signal uh, to increase the uh, the uh, communication length? Over. Yeah, yeah. So so um, so direct transmission uh, without quantum repeaters or quantum memories uh, has a limited range. Um, the world record for doing quantum key distribution is just over five hundred kilometers, and that's using a twin field QKD technique. Uh, direct transmission is about 400, maybe, maybe just below 500 kilometers. So going beyond that distance, definitely below 1,000 kilometers, you need um, a quantum repeater or a quantum, well, quantum repeaters. There are memory, memory less quantum repeaters, but most quantum repeaters, practical ones, are probably going to have to use um, quantum memories. Um, you can use quantum memories for fiber-based networks. But um, the problem there is that typically when you do the modeling of, of how often you need to put a quantum repeater, you need to put them every several, you know, maybe tens of kilometers. So if you think about how to span the Atlantic Ocean, right, you need hundreds of these possibly, um, to, um, or 100 or 200 of these. And these things are not going to be simple devices and probably would be difficult to put them on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, right? Um, it's going to be difficult to put them in the space, but because of the losses, the reduced losses in space, you only need a couple of them. So um, we've shown that you only need maybe um, perhaps, you know, eight or seven memories in space, and you could, you know, go around the world with and produce entanglement. Um, whereas if you try to do it using fibers, you'd take a, a, a far greater um, amount of them, right? Um, so yeah, I think quantum repeaters as a way of getting around this exponential um, decay of a signal, um, you know, that is going to be useful for medium range applications, even in, in fiber. So you could think of, you know, maybe between two countries or within a small country that they could be used. Uh, so I think these repeaters and quantum memories will have, have utility, not just in space, but also on the ground. Sure, thank you. Yeah, the only reason I was really mentioning it also is just because that's uh, uh, an area of vulnerability in regards to, you know, trapping the signal and trying to uh, uh, view or, or man in the middle the, uh, the network. But uh, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, I think, I think you're, so you're, you're referring to trusted node repeaters? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So if you have a trusted node repeater, yes, that is a, that is a vulnerability and you have to, it's trusted node. So um, yeah. So it's just like what I was describing with the trusted node satellite. You can do the same thing on the ground if you have a, a basically a decode and, re and, and, and repeat kind of thing, uh, but in a quantum sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a hand up from... Um... Yeah. Hi, this is Hi. Raja. Hi. Uh, quick question. So uh, although QKD is unconditionally secure, that's only theoretically, right? and implementations could be attacked, compromised. Um, so can you tell me sort of in the difference between, let's say, uh, free space or satellite QKD and uh, fiber optic QKD in terms of attacks and in terms of security yeah. compromises? Is one better, one yeah. worse? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, Implementation security is, is um, going to be the, the major concern. Um, theoretically, you know, we can we can write down the security parameters and, and yeah, but if it's not implemented um, correctly, if there are side channel attacks, um, that, that can compromise the security. In terms of uh, fiber based, the thing about fiber based, I guess, is that um, you don't know where your fiber is, right? Once the fiber disappears through the wall, um, you don't know where yeah what's happened to it so um in a sense 
Um, free space communication, you know, practically you can sort of see what, if, is anything in the line of sight? Is, is anything actually intercepting your beam? So um, even conventional laser comms, people try to, try to promote the idea that, that, that free space laser comms is inherently more secure than radio comms because of the beam divergence is much smaller. You can see anything in, the, in, in who's intercepting your signal. Um, the, the, the fact that your satellite is very difficult to intercept um, and to tamper with, um, you know, that is possibly a, a plus. But in a, also another sense, it's very difficult to check. So, you know, the, you know, space warfare and the ability to intercept and to covertly tamper with uh, in-orbit assets is actually a big concern. So one would have to be really careful about hardening your satellite, um, you know, from conventional communication. So, you know, hackers um, on-orbit tampering. So, you know, uh, people are using satellites to, to come up to other satellites and actually attack them from, from short range, uh, both um, RF, uh, optically, um, you know, potentially even physically. So um, I, I, think, I think this is why people want to go to this untrusted node network um, where you don't have to trust the satellite. You can verify that the correlations that you actually uh, measure are secure. Um, so that would obviate uh, some of the concerns there. Um, Free space transmission, there are some attacks which um, are possible um, in free space and say, oh, well, yeah, yeah there are, there are lo lots of very interesting ways that one could try to tamper with the free space system, which um, aren't necessarily the same as for a fiber system. So um, I would say that, you know, these concerns still exist. And, and I think, I think it, is, it is part of the, the challenge into making sure that a practical system uh, obeys as much of the theoretical assumptions as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Probably one more question and I really need to go. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so um, Avinash has uh, also has some, uh, has a question as well. Um, Avinash, please come and join us. Uh, that's a great talk by Professor Daniel. Uh, so I wanted to know the uh, computer science aspects in this. Uh, so uh, how can we convert this classical data uh, that can, uh, so that it can be transferred through these devices and to and fro? Uh, ah, so that, right. uh, yeah, that's uh, broadly my question. Thank you. Yeah, so um, so for secure communication, you just use the encryption key that's generated through PKD to encrypt it using any any uh, symmetric key protocol that you that you want. Uh, if you if you want to do it uh, absolutely securely, you use one time pad. If you relax your security requirements, you can use something like AES or something like that. Um, we would not generally use quantum channels for, for transmitting uh, classical information because there are much better and more efficient ways of transmitting classical information directly. Um, so that's one thing we would use it. You know, if we want to do secure communication, yes, we would use the quantum keys that we derive. Um, that said, there are ways of encoding classical information in quantum states and decoding them in a quantum way that could be very beneficial for very long distance communication. For instance, um, if you want to communicate optically from, say, Mars, uh, you want to be able to, to send efficiently using as few photons as, po as possible, as many bits as possible. So there are ways of encoding more than one bit per photon um, using uh, pulse position uh, modulation. But if you then use a coherent way of encoding that information in a quantum way uh, and then decoding it, then you can actually get potentially more robust ways of transferring classical information over very long distances. So that's what I was saying that this is called the quantum enhanced classical communication, but we're using um, quantum ways, mainly on the, on the decoding side, on the receiver side, where we're measuring the signals using um, highly sensitive single photon detectors, but in a, in a particular way. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rupsa. Um, I, I really have to go. I need to pick yeah. up my daughter uh, <laughs> after school. So um, I, I apologize for not being able to, to, to continue on the discussion, but, but uh, I hope that this has been 
um, at least you know, informative and, and entertaining at least. And um, I'm sorry I can't go through all of the, the, the questions or discussion points, but I hope that you were able to, and I'm sure there are some other knowledgeable, I, 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 I think there are other knowledgeable people in the discussion who probably should be able to, to also contribute. And Daniel, thank, thanks for such a fantastic talk. It's been uh, really active in, in the chat box. Um, and I, I think, you know, everyone, everyone's learned a lot from it. And um, Daniel will also be back on the 30th when we'll have a, an entangled discussion with all of this month's speakers. Uh, so there's another opportunity coming up then. Um, we're also in December. Um, all of this year's guests will be coming back for um, cross quantum panels as well. So. I won't give too much of a spoiler away on that, but there will be other opportunities to uh, to pick Daniel's brains on these things. So um, thanks for such a wonderful talk today, Daniel. It's been really fantastic and, and informative. Um, and um, we return next week as well, as always. So um, we'll be um, back next week with Dr. Sonali Mahopatra um, of Craft, uh, Craft Prospect. Um, and she'll be discussing taking quantum and AI into space. So come and join us at the same time next week for more fascinating discussions and, um, and to come and join us too. So thanks, everyone. Take care and see you next week.